Welcome to UStrat, the US of India's strategic dialogues. Today, I will be speaking to the Swedish Pakistani political scientist, Professor Ishtiak Ahmed, the author of the book titled Jinnah, His Successes, Failures, and Role in History. Some may wonder why a book on Jinnah should figure on strategic dialogues. Strategy is about preparing for the future, and what better way to prepare for the future other than by knowing very correctly about what happened in the past. Professor Ishtiak Ahmed is well known. However, a short introduction is the norm, so I will tell you that he holds a PhD in political science from Stockholm University and is presently Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the same university. He is a senior fellow at the Institution of South Asian Studies National University of Singapore. He has taught during winter sessions at the Lahore University of Management Sciences and at Government College Lahore. He has published several books with a special focus on the politics of South Asia. Today we shall be talking about his latest book that is Jinnah, His Successes, Failures and Role in History. Professor Ahmed in his book has given a very unbiased account of Jinnah and how the momentous events came to pass which led to partition and sadly the enduring enmity between the two nations. He has used impeccable and irrefutable sources for his findings. I am sanguine that whenever peace returns to the subcontinent, an important factor that can aid it from coming back is removal of the flawed perceptions in the minds of the citizens of both countries about why this or that decision was taken by the leaders in the years leading to partition and independence. Misperceptions of each other's motives creates mistrust and adds fuel to the enduring India-Pakistan rivalry. Historical writings like that of Professor Ishtia Kemal clear many cobwebs and such ambiguous events, uh, issues that exist. With this, we will start. Uh, good evening, Professor Ahmed. Uh, it is, of course, afternoon at this moment at uh, Sweden. So, a very good afternoon to you. To start off with, there is a very stock question that every interview asks. And uh, so, the stock first question is that anyone who writes a book does so because he has a, uh, something to tell. So when right. you decided to write this, uh, you know, very exhaustive book on Jinnah, so what is the message that you wanted to tell? Well, the message was to find out what the truth was about the partition and what role did Jinnah play and what role his peers play uh, in response to which uh, Jinnah then uh, found his own way of going about in politics. And uh, the hope is that once people have read the book, they will understand what sort of a man Jinnah was as a leader, uh, what were the circumstances in which he moved from being the ambassador of Hin Hindu-Muslim unity to the most uncompromising uh, uh, advocate of the division of India and the creation of two uh, separate states on the basis of religious majorities on both sides and the consequences of, of such a partition. Also, I wanted to bring uh, into the limelight in a deep sense the role of the power which was presiding over all these events, and that was the British colonial state. They must have had an interest in finally giving the partition the way they did. So all these things had been touched by different writers, and there is so much controversy. I mean, what Indian writers say, the Pakistani writers normally just give the opposite interpretation to the same events. I thought that my task is to detach myself from all this and try, if I can, to look at it in a comprehensive, connected manner. And my impression is that I have been quite successful. Uh, so the book is now going to be published in Pakistan. Already uh, one discussion and in English has taken place with Raza Rumi, who is a leading Pakistani journalist. It was done recently on uh, for Think Fest, you know, which is sir, sir. sort of like uh, you know, in India you have the Jaipur 
literature festival and then in Lahore there are some such events. This is a Lahore based event called Think Fest. So uh, even Raza Rumi uh, had to acknowledge that the book brings in uh, a new way of looking at the life of Muhammad Ali Jinnah and the politics around him. So on both sides I have people who are uh, acknowledging that the book does try to transcend the usual limitations of being associated with one national narrative or another. So I think this is what I've done. And uh, I'm sure when people read this book, it will go a long way in explaining what happened, how and why. And what can we do now to go beyond the legacy, that bitter legacy of the partition? That's my hope. Thank you, sir. And of, of course, uh, while I'm at it, I must also, uh, you know, tell our readers that when I read the book, it, it's a very thick, it's a very daunting book. But uh, what is more important about an author is not only the material that he is putting in, in the book, but also how is he conveying it in a manner that the readers are able to assimilate it uh, in a very easy manner. And uh, sir, must I, I may compliment you that you have done that. So this very, very, uh, you know, for formidable looking book, which is about 800 pages with the index and the, uh, you know, uh, the notes at the end. Uh, I was able to read it, uh, I would say, in a fairly short period of time. Uh, I, it's not that I read it in one sitting, but uh, it didn't take me very long at all. And I really enjoyed it. Now, well, uh, come here. Sir, 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 please. No, I'm, I'm very grateful you say that. Uh, you know, I got good assistance, editing assistance also. So let me be humble enough that basically it's my writing and then we have worked on it. And all my books, once people start reading them, the clarity of thought, nobody can deny. So that's my forte, I would say. Uh, that very complex things, I make it possible for the normal, well-read, intelligent person to grasp easily. And I think this is what a scholar must really try to do, rather than indulge in, uh, you know, uh, uh, scaring people with a lot of verbosity and, and so on. That's not the point. So I'm glad you feel that way. It's indeed 800 pages is a lot to read. Uh, but but. Those who are sincere and interested in the subject don't find it difficult to go through the whole book. So that's that's the strength of the book. Thank you so much. You're very right, sir. Uh, sir, my next question is that, you know, conservative side, uh, Jinnah's desire to create an Islamic state and liberals side to his, uh, you know, soaring appeals for tolerance. Yeah. Uh, I've heard uh, Miss Aisha Jalal, I uh, heard her on the YouTube also. And of course, I did not read a book, but I did glance through a book. I've heard her say that he cared for the minorities. So what is the view about his relationship or his views on the minorities that you conveyed in this book, sir? Well, I would say like this. When the Indian National Congress approached the people of the subcontinent, it spoke for all Indian people without, uh, you know, putting them in boxes like Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, and so on. So their ideology is meant for all bona fide Indians born in the Indian subcontinent. If you look at the All India Muslim League and Muhammad Ali Jinnah's appeals, his messages, his uh, statements, they are exclusively meant for Indian Muslims. And when Pakistan came into being, I think you had a problem with Chapter 19 because it is repetitive. I can understand your uh, observation, but I wanted to demonstrate to Pakistanis that he repeatedly directed things only, you can look at the wording, only in one case, case he speaks of Pakistanis. All rest are meant for Pakistani Muslims. So the nation he had in mind, and rightly so, he was not struggling 
for any other minority except the Muslims, that the Muslims themselves were deeply divided on sect and so many other things was his very successful uh, uh, way of uh, concealing uh, by, by addressing all of them. And there is a saying in Punjabi, Peer sabnu putter denda. You know, when you go to a holy man, he promises all that you want to hear. So to the ulama, he gave the promise that, of course, in Pakistan, there is no question that the Sharia will not apply. How is it possible? Then to other groups, he gave ideas of a modern state, sometimes of a democracy, saying that Pakistan is not a theocracy. And I deal with this thing also, whether to say that something is not a theocracy means that it's a secular state. It does not. I have said Pakistan, the Muslims have their own way of rightly insisting that when they say that it's based on the sovereignty of God, they don't mean the sovereignty or the supremacy of the clergy. They mean the supremacy of the Sharia law. So it's not a secular state. It's it's still a state based on the supremacy of the Sharia, even if it's not a theocracy. So I have tried to explain all this. And then to some people, he has pointedly said that it will be an Islamic state. And at other times that it will be a modern, modern democracy. So these were the type of uh, uh, promises or uh, ideas, pledges that he gave. And, and I think the main argument I put forward is in sharp contrast to Aisha Jalal who says that he did not want the partition. He wanted a power sharing deal and use the Pakistan demand only as a bargaining chip. I've said it's diametrically opposite. He had absolutely no idea of what sort of a Pakistan ultimately would emerge. His whole concentration was to justify the partition of India, the division of India to create Pakistan. And in that Pakistan, of course, when he talks about Islam and its treatment of minorities, he gives examples of the Holy Prophet having first depleted the Jews and Christians and then treated them very well. Then some people mention uh, the Charter of Medina and I've shown that the Charter of Medina lasted for a short while between Jews and Muslims when the Prophet moved from Mecca to Medina. But thereafter, there was a conflict with the Jewish tribes and that uh, uh, charter then became obsolete. It's the Quranic verse which says that uh, Christians and Jews and Sabians can live among Muslims uh, by paying the jazia, which is the protection tax. And then this was extended by analogy to India, where Muhammad bin Qasim uh, wanted a ruling on how to deal with the Hindus and uh, Buddhists who had become subjects of the uh, uh, Islamic Caliphate established, which had a fo foothold in, in Sindh. And the ruling was that they too ultimately believe in the same God. So if they pay you the jizya, you can let them practice their own religion and repair their religious uh, uh, temples and so on and so forth, which I think in... Uh, early 8th century was a very advanced way of dealing with the minority question. But in the 20th, 21st century, I think that is outdated. Now the norm is that uh, states should not discriminate, discriminate against minorities. Uh, okay, you can have special treatment maybe because of some uh, uh, specific reasons. But ultimately the aim is to integrate everybody into one political nation, one nation state. So Jinnah's statements on minorities is largely that uh, Muslims should treat them well. But you rightly pointed out in your introduction, the 11th October 1947 speech, when he addressed, I think, the military uh, officers, yeah. saying that uh, 
we want to take care of the minorities, but they don't seem to trust us. And uh, uh, therefore, there is a problem with the minorities in Pakistan. So there you can see that for him, minorities are a category outside the Muslim nation that he founded. But the emphasis is that we should protect them and, and uh, treat them well. But the precondition is that they should be loyal to Pakistan and trust the Pakistan government, things like that. Right, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, of course, uh, this is an aside, not really from the book, but I said, since you are here, I must, uh, you know, clarify this doubt of mine, which I had while I was reading a number of books and yeah. uh, including, including your book, sir, that, yeah. you know, the Jazia is a very reviled sort of tax. And of course, Akbar had removed it for a period of time and Aurangzeb had reimposed it. Yeah. Now, in, in a particular place, uh, I really, I don't think it's in your book, sir, uh, but I've read it that, uh, uh, you see, as far as the Muslims were concerned, they were supposed to pay a part of their earning as zakat, and uh, which was, uh, you know, uh, that is a done thing in Islam. So a similar amount was supposed to be paid by Jazia, uh, uh, through Jazia, and which meant that uh, those who pay it uh, are the non-Muslims, and by paying it, they are uh, entitled to protection. And right. what... Uh, what I read was, which was uh, I was unclear about, it said that the jazia, uh, the percentage of the tax on the poorer people was higher than on the richer people. So that is something that I was, uh, I read this in a book. Yeah, I mean, when the uh, scholars, the jurists who interpreted Islamic law known as fiqh jurisprudence, so, they saw uh, to it that the poor and the and children and women were not charged uh, jazia. Only those yeah. who could pay the jazia uh, were under obligation to do it. And apart from zakat, there was also a land tax imposed on the Muslims. So the jazia, in a way, was a fair tax of protection. And then you were not expected to fight in the holy wars of the Muslim state or the Islamic state. So there was a plus point to that as well. But in one sense, it did distinguish between Muslims and non-Muslims. Uh, both had rights, but differential rights, which for that time, I think, was very progressive, very enlightened. Uh, just look at how the Christians dealt with the Jews over and over again in Europe. Uh, the pogroms, the attacks on Jews uh, were horrible. And then comes the Holocaust. The Muslim treatment of minorities, by comparison, has not been so bad. Of course, there have been some people who came to India and other places and converted people by force and attacked uh, the holy places of non-Muslims. That's also a fact of life. Uh, the English Anglican people went to Ireland and used to have their horses, you know, uh, the, the Catholic churches used as uh, uh, stables, you know. So this, this way of humiliating the defeated has been part of the way uh, things were done in the past. It's only in the 20th century that efforts are made that everybody has human rights. Humanitarian law applies in the case of war and uh, POWs and so on. So we have moved beyond those practices. But those practices were meant to prove that the side which lost must also be humiliated in some way. That's very yes. sad, but that happened. I mean, I have read, may I say this, that in southern India, uh, the Shaivite and the, you know, the other group of Hindus, they were that's fighting. That's right. no. Yeah, they fought one another over who would control the temples? So there is a skeleton in the cupboard of all of us. Sir, sir. So we, we should not hide that. We should acknowledge that. And, and we should try to repair the wounds. Buddha said this. And Guru Nanak said this. Uh, uh, Nanak Dukhya Sab Sansar. So that's the spirit in which I write my thing. Uh, whatever I write, 
it's meant to heal wounds not that the we should deny the wounds inflicted that would not be fair but we should have the courage to acknowledge that this was done and now it's a time to go beyond them and embrace one another if one can very rightly said sir and uh, now uh, some say that jinnah secured pakistan only through constitutional means and uh, uh, he did not uh, really use any of the other things that were being used by the congress let us say like satyagraha or civil disobedience so were there instances where he joined in uh, movements like the satyagraha or civil disobedience or is it correct that he used only constitutional means and maybe he also used politics and subterfuge uh, your views on that sir i think this question that he used uh, constitutional means uh comes to an end when he gives the call to direct action and direct action call was on 29th july 1946 it resulted in the great calcutta ca- killing of uh, 16 we started on 16th august and then that contagion spread to many other parts of india uh and so i don't think after that uh he was just confining his way of doing politics to constitutional means he continued with that as did the congress even when they were calling for civil disobedience and so on but in this case after 16th august 1946 it leads to a large scale planned communal violence so i would not agree at all that he got pakistan only through constitutional means he let this mob psychology this mav mob demonization dehumanization of the other take place in order to uh, give a, you know create a hype about a pakistan in which the old ideal state of islam will be revived and and then a new world order will come into being or at least a new order within pakistan and so on and so forth so no i don't accept that at all i think it's a mix in which violence and uh, you know slogans demonizing the other let's say the hindus were uh, used in the uh, uh, mass Uh, uh, agitations, and I give ample proof of this of that in my partition of Punjab book, and then again in this book on Jena, I've ma- I've mentioned that. So his constitutionalism came to an end once the Cal- Great Cal- uh, Calcutta killing started. Right, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh- uh the next uh, point that i have sir this question is to you as the author of this book on jena okay. and also also as a political scientist that you are sir so in your book you have said that jena would have accepted india as a federation mm. however i found our institution the usi of india has a 150 year old institution and we have a very very old library and uh, i found a book in the library uh that is nationalism in conflict in india now I this see. book uh, this book is written before partition sir and hmm. uh, the foreword is written by mr jena sir and he has written the foreword on 24 december 1942 I and in the, in the foreword he has made it very clear that partition of india is in, in the interest of both the major nations hindus and muslims so hmm. if he was very clear in 1942 also that partition is in the interests of hindus and muslims then did he uh, uh, you know did he view it as partition and then forming a federation and what is your view on federation sir are federation strong enough that they can uh, be cohesive or uh, because if a federation has too strong a center then it's not really a federation in the true sense of the word right uh, you, sir well first of all I don't think I've ever suggested that he wanted a federation. After, let's say, the twenty-second March, nineteen forty speech in Lahore in the presidential address, from there onwards, 
there is absolutely no idea of he preferring a federation of india a united unitary india no not at all he insists on the partition and that is where i think aisha jalal has been uh, uh, as a scholar has been uh, suppressing withholding the facts uh, what did he want what did he say and i have given that all it's all in the public now so anybody say who says he wanted a federated federal india is is absolutely off the mark and is actually uh, uh, misleading by saying that what they can latch on is what happened when the cabinet mission plan uh, delegation came and they talked to the leaders and on the 4th of april 1946 the delegation told mr jena that look mr jena unless you can show us how pakistan which was then you know being discussed in terms of east and west pakistan with india in between can be defensible you leave us no choice but to leave india united and that was an ultimatum he immediately understood he was very sharp politically that that means leaving india on the terms of the indian national congress so only then he you know he stepped back and grudgingly finally on the 6th of june advised the the council of the all india muslim league which is the executive body that i you uh, i suggest that we accept the cabinet mission plan but already uh, the plan suggests groupings into three uh, you know a b and c and east and west pakistan are guaranteed by uh, group b and c and we will work towards the creation of pakistan because there is a, a provision that after 10 years the groups or individual provinces can uh, uh, decide whether they want to remain in the indian union or not so he had to say all that in order to make the muslim leaguers accept because for 7 years and until the 6th of june until even on the fifth one day earlier he said no question we will have partition and we will have a separate pakistan so this happened very suddenly and i can understand that the council was a bit unprepared but then he told them that we are still working for pakistan now what is a federation and when does it work i i have gone at great length to analyze the motilal nehru report which i think is the finest brainstorming possible of all indians that mr jena decided not to take part in it i think was uh, a decision which uh, was unfortunate because had he been there i'm sure with his persuasive way of uh, uh, make presenting his case he could have got some concessions you know but once you don't take part in an ongoing national enterprise to find a constitutional framework then that's too bad and the motilal nehru report takes care of the need for india to have an effective center and i think if you look at the way the subjects are divided between the center and the provinces about 67 subjects are given to the provinces and about 39 38 to the center the center of course has precedence because uh jawaharlal nehru and i think these people wanted the state to intervene in the interest of fundamental rights and education and so on uh and they wanted an effective center and my argument is that once pakistan came into being mr jina had to work towards a center 10 times stronger than whatever was uh, 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 presented in the motilal nehru report and what became then part of the indian constitution so a federation is 
one in which there is a division of uh, uh, powers, but the center has the final uh, authority to ensure that nobody can secede from a federation. Whereas a confederation is one in which you are voluntarily a member, but you can leave any time. So I think a federation uh, does divide powers between the center and uh, the federating units. Uh, but an effective center is also necessary in the modern times to develop coherent and cohesive policies. And, and so that's my point of view on what a federation is. And I think the Indian constitution is a federation. It's called the Union uh, of India. And it, Sir. the units are called states and not provinces. Sir. So some people think that this is meant to emphasize the importance of the units. Maybe that's true. And, uh, and so that's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, while we are at, uh, at it, uh, uh, could I ask that, you know, Jinnah did not sell his bungalow that he had in, uh, you know, Malabar Hill in Bombay, which still remains, uh, of course, as disputed property there. Yeah. So w was it that he thought that at a particular point of time in the future, India and Pakistan would be like USA and Canada or like India and Nepal, uh, you know, where people could come across freely and you know, own property in each other's country or work in each other's countries. Did he ever uh, have that in view? Well, he, in some of his speeches, you know, one to Australia and one to the United States, he does suggest something like Canada and the US, you know. But that's one part when he's speaking to foreign audiences and he's looking for their support for Pakistan. So it's a diplomatic way of presenting his case. But all other statements in relation to India are based on the suspicion that India is out there to undo us. And uh, so it, that's the mainstream. And I think the Indians listen to that part of his speeches, not what he said to the, uh, uh, to the people of the United States, to Australia. I don't think that was very interesting for them. But the daily uh, statements that he was issuing continued with this old way of thinking that uh, uh, the Indian National Congress represents Hindu Raj and uh, since we have got Pakistan, uh, uh, India is trying its uh, all its maneuvers to weaken Pakistan, to undo Pakistan, that an existenceless threat exists. So then the question is why this Grand mansion he built in uh, uh, Bombay, Malabar, yes. and to which he was so emotionally attached. Well, I have argued that uh, since his daughter married a non-Muslim, uh, if he were now to say that he is a Muslim, either Sunni or Shia or whatever, then under Islamic law, that is not permissible, that he could own the house. But he could gift it to her, even then. Gifting it is still allowed in Islamic law. He didn't do that. I think just before uh, the decision to partition India was taken, and, and it was very late, he had been trying to sell that house, I think, to Dalmia or whatever. And he wanted 21 lakhs, and the other party was offering 18 lakhs. He was successful when it came to his house in uh, Delhi. It was told, sold for 12 lakhs. So there are different theories about it. And then we have this uh, anecdotal story about the Indian first Indian High Commissioner, Sri Prakasha, saying that Jinnah told him that uh, tell Nehru not to, uh, you know, treat my house in India as a enemy property, you know, evacuee property, and uh, uh, this partition was all wrong. Let's join hands and, and undo it. Uh, well, the thing is, we Sri Prakasha doesn't tell us what Nehru said in response, but what we can establish is 
that even if he said this, this was a private message. And I think he just wanted to retain his ownership right uh, on that house. And this could be a maneuver just for that. And if he was very serious, then he didn't understand that millions of people had been uprooted from their homes. And millions on our side and on the Indian side were in refugee camps. And uh, their ancestral abodes had been uh, uh, taken away from them. So in such circumstances, wanting to go and live uh, in his own house, he built brick by brick. It's very difficult for me to understand as a, a man in touch with those times that he lived in towards the end. So there are, I mean, there is no way to make sense of this. But since this the Indian High Commissioner, who is the source of this story, so it there must be some basis for it. Uh, but I think he had a choice. Even of under Islamic law, his property in Pakistan could not be inherited by his daughter. But he could gift the property in Bombay to her, which he did not. Because I think he was very, it was very important for him to maintain the impression that he was a true Muslim. So, and, so. and I think that was for him a part of his uh, way of asserting his identity and proving that he's the true leader of Muslims. That he's Thank not, you, yeah, that he doesn't give way to emotions when it comes to principles. Sort of, sort of that thinking. Right, sir. Right. Uh, so the other thing, which of course it is there in your book also, that his, uh, you know, policies as far as the princely states were concerned, was a little, uh, you know, ambiguous sort of policy. Uh, that uh, you can say that was he not very clear about what did he really want to do, because uh, you know he accepted uh, Kalat state to remain uh, independent. Of course, initially I am not very clear that when did. Uh, uh, finally, uh, Kalat, uh, you know, joined Pakistan, or was it when it was taken over? Okay. Similarly, like, like when Junagadh acceded, he accepted the accession. Uh, yeah. When acceded to India, uh, there was objections, but probably, uh, yes, it happened during his time only, while he was alive. So, uh, and then there's the issue of Hyderabad also, where, uh, of course, that was the first time I read, so I was not really aware of it. That there was a proposal uh, from Patel uh, that uh, you know you don't uh, push for Hyderabad's independence and we will let you keep Kashmir. So these were that was of course a new thing. Uh, so all this policy with the princely states, uh, uh, what was uh, his? Uh, what did he really want, sir? That's very interesting. I mean, I'm saying that the seven years of his politics focuses just on one thing, how to justify the partition of India. And in doing that, he had to neutralize the princely states by saying that Pakistan will not interfere in with the sovereignty and the independence of the princely states uh, to win a goodwill. Uh, and he let Indian National Congress say that India would want uh, all sorts of uh, units to be part of the Indian Federation. So it was the Indian National Congress which uh, I think uh, uh, declared it to the princely states that they will have to decide either to join India or Pakistan. Remaining independent was not a choice given them. But you know, from the British side, there were this Sir uh, Conrad, uh, something I've given the name of this man, who represented the old conservative British way of thinking that, uh, okay, we leave parts of India, but we return to India through the princely states, which can remain independent, and then we can be their advisors and so on and so forth. So I think Jinnah was being advised by them to keep on agreeing that the princely states will remain independent. 
But once partition took place, and uh, there were states like Junagadh, where there was a Muslim Nawab, but the majority were Hindus, uh, Jinnah accepted his accession. And uh, then on Hyderabad, as I've noted, uh, from Sardar Patel, there was uh, an offer that if you do not poke your nose in Hyderabad, you can keep Kashmir. And Chaudhary Muhammad Ali, who was a very close confidant of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, he was head of the Pakistan bureaucracy in 1947, uh, had represented the Muslim League in the uh, discussion on uh, the partition, how to distribute the shared assets of, of the colonial state. And uh, he later on became Prime Minister of Pakistan as well. He says that on the 22nd of December or the 2nd of December, definitely we got this message from India on Kashmir that you keep Kashmir if you don't uh, raise a stake on Hyderabad. He says, I went to Mr. Jinnah and uh, told him about this offer. But Mr. Jinnah, the great tactician, did not seem to be interested. He was aiming, he was, uh, aiming for some higher stakes. So I think Jinnah thought that Kashmir, having such a huge Muslim majority, would automatically become part of Pakistan. And that's why they, these Mujahideen were also sent into Kashmir to ensure that that happened. Of course, the Indian National Congress wanted Kashmir to join uh, India, but the Maharaja wanted to remain independent if he can. So Pakistan uh, had a chance of, of uh, Getting Kashmir, maybe, uh, if it didn't want, if it didn't encourage Hyderabad to declare its independence or its decision to join Pakistan. So Jinnah bungled up the question of princely states in many other ways. You know, there was a state in uh, on the Sindh border. Uh, I, I forget its name in in Rajputana or something. He tried to encourage the ruler to join Pakistan, but then uh, I think Sardar Patel dissuaded him. And then even a state somewhere in southern India uh, expressed an opinion or in, was encouraged by Jinnah to join Pakistan. Because Jinnah said that he will not interfere uh, in the way the princely states ran their own internal affairs. Whereas Congress was on record in wanting to integrate the princely states into the Indian Union. So there was a big difference. Uh, so though, uh, yeah, we are, uh, you know, very clear that Jinnah built uh, Pakistan uh, hmm. on, the, uh, on, the, on the differentiation of faiths. But yeah. uh, do you feel that Islam offered a complete identity to Pakistan? Or did it need something more to be able to form an identity for itself as a country? Or was Islam just good enough, sir? Uh, and of course, that question arises, uh, I think it will be a related, uh, related question along with it. That if, suppose right in the beginning, East Pakistan and West Pakistan had been two separate countries. And yeah. uh, of course, confederation was something that you just explained. Suppose there had been two separate countries as a confederation, would that have been a more viable structure, sir? Well, one thing I didn't complete, you know, regarding the question of princely states. Let me add that uh, about Kalath. You wanted to know that, huh? sir, sir, sir. So till June 1947, Jinnah was on record that Kalath will remain independent and so on. Uh, but uh, and on the 11th of August, the Khan of Klath declared uh, independence as well. So that's also true. Uh, and then started the pressure on him, Jinnah and the rest, uh, 
trying to persuade him to accede to Pakistan. And from all the evidence we know, he was cajoled, coerced into joining Pakistan because there were smaller states, you know, within the Kalat Confederation, whose rulers already uh, the Muslim League had convinced that they could join Pakistan and they would have this, this, this freedom. So Kalat then finally did exceed, but uh, Pakistan's military was sent in, I think, in the end of March. On the 1st of April, they were in Kalat's city. And that's how Kalat then became a part of Pakistan. So that uh, incident, I thought I should also explain. That the first Hyderabad, India sent its forces into Hyderabad on the 13th of September, two days after Jinnah had died. But the Pakistani forces went into Kalat already during the lifetime of Jinnah. Okay? So that's one thing. So, now the second was East and West Pakistan. You see, originally, the 1923rd March 1940 resolution talks about Muslim states. And that means at least two states, one in Bengal and one in uh, Northwestern uh, subcontinent. Uh, <laughs> this is a very interesting history. When Pakistan or the Muslim League demanded uh, separate states for Muslims. Ten days later, uh, Sardar Sundar Singh Majitia of the Sikh Nationalist Party uh, came out and said that we are against the partition of India on a religious basis. But if India is, partic uh, uh, India is partitioned on such a basis, we would want the non-Muslim majority districts of the Punjab to be given either to a Sikh state or to India. The Indian National Congress till March 1947 tried to keep, to, to, to insist on India remaining united. It's on the 8th of March 1947 that the Indian National Congress passes a resolution saying that we support the Sikh demand for the partition of Punjab. If India is partitioned, then we want the Punjab to be partitioned as well. And then the Indian National Congress and even Hindu Mahasabha insisted that the same principle should apply to Bengal. So if Bengal, the Hindu majority districts should be given to India and the rest could be with Pakistan. So at the very last moment, sometimes in April, it became clear that uh, yeah, and within the Muslim League, there were two points of view. One, that uh, uh, East Pakistan should become independent. And the second was that they should join Pakistan. Those who wanted East Bengal, sorry, East Bengal to remain part of Greater Bengal, this was Hussain Shahid Sorwardi and the elder brother of uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, I think Sarat Bose. They wanted a greater Bengal sort of uh, third dominion in India. Actually, there was the idea of Punjab being also another dominion by Sir Khizar Hayatiwana. But the British ruled, overruled all this and in the end decided to divide or partition India into India and Pakistan as two dominions. So the final decision was that of the British. Right, sir. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, I, I, uh, yes, sir. Uh, would Bengal and Pakistan then, was it important to have a confederation? I think no. They could have been two different states then. Why have a confederation at all if you don't have, uh, you know, uh, borders adjacent to one another, you are not contiguous to each other? So they may have become a confederation if they wanted, but they could have been a different state also if that scheme had succeeded. So there were many different uh, uh, possibilities. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Uh, sir, at the All India Muslim League session at uh, Lahore on from 22nd to 24th March, the, it is a report, 1940s. Huh? Yeah. Lala, Lala Lajpat Rai uh, was quoted in a letter to Mr. C. R. Das, uh, and uh, this letter was of 1925 was quoted, sir. That's correct. And, yes, sir. And he had said that if we get together with the Muslims, we will not be able to rule this country on democratic lines. Because he said that if his reading of Islamic law is correct, then Islam by its very nature is an effective bar to anything of a democratic sort of kind. So are right. your views on that? So is that correct, sir, or is it uh, incorrect, sir? No, I think uh, the history of Lala Lajpat Rai is very interesting. You know, his father at one point converted to Islam and he was a follower of Sir Sayyid in the Naqshbandi Sufi order. But then when he found Sir Sayyid, uh, you know, dichotomizing Hindus and Muslims, his father returned to the Hindu faith. So within the family of Lala Lajpat Roy, you have this sort of feeling that uh, in Islam, then there is no scope for non-Muslims to be equal citizens. So this is where, what he wrote in 1925. To C. R. Das, who was a Bengali uh, leader who wanted all the concessions the Muslims were demanding to be given. But Lala Lajpat Rai told him that even if we do that, unless you are a Muslim, you cannot be part of the community. And who quotes this letter? Muhammad Ali Jinnah in his 22nd March presidential address to prove that it's not he who is saying this. Even the Hindus accept that in Islam, Muslims cannot be, uh, cannot allow non-Muslims to rule over them. So, uh, only dividing India into two states was the workable solution. Uh, and, well, in a way, this is right. Now we are 96 point some percent Muslims in Pakistan. How come Pakistan has not become a stronger democracy than India? Why do we have military rule? Why do we have uh, instability of civilian rule? So there is some problem if you want to make a state both Islamic and democratic, then you are neither fish nor fowl. So I think that is proven by the, by the experience of Pakistan in 73, 74 years now. Either you pref go for a secular state like all other parts of the world have done, or you create an Islamic state as Iran is, as Saudi Arabia is, as the Taliban tried, as somebody in Sudan tried for a while, and then Pakistan has been a laboratory for all these experiments for the 73, 74 years. I, right, my sir. only position is an Islamic or Muslim state cannot be a full-fledged democracy. It will be some sort of a differential democracy at best, or it will be a majoritarian Muslim state as it is at the moment. Although the Imran Khan government is making an effort to, to you know, provide scope for minorities and so on. But every day you find attacks on, on uh, you know, stigmatized minorities taking place. So, I mean, that's a fact. Unfortunately, in India, this is happening also. So, people like me, when we argue, then we have to hear the counter evidence from the other side. So, what can we do? This I, I can most, understand. Yeah, this is the most unfortunate development, actually. But I say that partly sending Mujahideen into Kashmir after the Afghan Jihad and the Mumbai attack, and not only Mumbai, also in Delhi, and there was an earlier attack on a train in Mumbai. You know, all these things uh, helped uh, Hindu nationalism play upon the fears of the people that uh, we are threatened. Uh, by Pakistan and by Mujahideen and 
obviously the fallout is on indian muslims who are a minority in india so partly what happens in pakistan has links or repercussions for what goes on in india which is not to say that there has not been a two nation theory of the hindu communalists also there is a very old history in which people mention savarkar and gowalkar and many others but those were marginal forces because mainstream was with the indian national congress now the situation is different that's that's very right sir and uh, of course i i can say uh, you know uh, being uh, in the security field uh, i am i would say i am partially a social scientist if you are a political scientist yeah so uh, there was a interview that i was uh, i think ikbal or uh, aftab ikbal or somebody from pakistan was having with you and uh, yeah. you made a point uh, that you know pakistan should uh, stop uh, permitting the non state actors uh, to mm. carry out uh, you know terrorist activities uh, in india Right. and uh, uh, he made a point he said no we can't do that because uh, they are not in our control and i think you insisted to know uh, a state should be able to control people within the borders so uh, this issue of non state actors that got me thinking that uh, this term non state actors is new but the concept is otherwise old that it may be very very old but i'll only go up to uh, you know the war in kashmir in 47 48 that the kabailis uh, who came inside uh, kashmir Uh, who were aided by uh, the establishment that time in pakistan they were a form of non state actors also only this term was not coined at that particular time and of course right. Is, right maybe it sometimes it is difficult for uh, you know uh, us to understand that also that what is the thing that drives uh, muslims towards the concept of being one nation so that particular thing of being one nation is also there and that's how you find people you know going to syria going to all over the place from all over europe because there is that particular feeling it may be misguided uh, but uh, it doesn't probably last for very long thereafter and uh, sir now uh, in the end i will ask you uh, the, the final question from my side sir and this is something which is there in the last part of your book sir uh, in the last part of your book you have uh, alluded to jinna and uh, we are back uh, to mr jana again uh, alluded to him in terms of a kalilian hero you uh, said and uh, so is it that uh, circumstances made him what he was or uh, did he have uh, it in him uh, there was a very old uh, movie made in uh, india you would have probably seen it sir called guide long time back devanand movie yes i have seen it i have seen it yes sir in which a very normal person just by circumstances is uh, forced to become a saint uh, yeah. and uh, he of course uh, has to pay for it with his life by going on a fast run to death sort of thing so he is just forced by the people so is it that the people made him a hero or did he have some qualities if he had these qualities what were those qualities well i think it is the second type he was a man of uh leadership qualities who would not agree to being second playing second fiddle to anyone so that leadership sort of confidence in him was uh uh extremely strong but circumstances did help him i sometimes say that after this direct action in uh, calcutta the british could have arrested mr jena or sorwardi and the rest as they have done uh, as they had been doing when it came to direct action of the indian national congress including the quit india movement but nobody touched the main muslim league leadership so were it not for the british support for such actions somewhere in the british deep state i'm sure he was being helped uh so the circumstances finally helped him a lot but he is not the one who has been pushed forward by the circumstances he created the circumstances and then he had some favorable 
objective factors supporting him forward. So he belongs to a category of people who are born leaders, but then they are also very lucky in historical terms. Sir, thank you so much for your time, sir. And um, of, of course, once again, may I say uh, that uh, we do hope that you keep on writing books like this, uh, which uh, clear the air between uh, you know two nations. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm sure you'll write books concerning other subjects also. It's, it's not that you will be here only. And should you ever decide to write a book on a similar subject, uh, may I uh, invite you here to the USI of India, sir? Our library is very, very, very uh, you know, it's got very, very good books. And of course, uh, this will, uh, it will look, uh, the print will look ultra. But uh, this, this is the book I found there when I started looking around uh, for some books on Mr. Jinnah. And of course, I found books, the new ones also. But this is the one which had that foreword by him of 1942, sir. And yeah. uh, uh, it also says that he was living that time in 9 Aurangzeb Road. Uh, he was living in 10 Aurangzeb Road. And I see. Uh, so that got me thinking because as a child, I've been to 9 Aurangzeb Road where one of my uncles was, uh, you know, he had his accommodation there. So I see. Uh, I see. it may, really made me feel that, oh, I was in a house right next to a very historical sort of house. And of course, we don't know. Uh, I mean, out here, I think nobody remembers that Mr. Jena also stayed in 10 Aurangzeb Road. Uh, which, of course, now is called 10 Abdul Kalam Road. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. You have uh, changed yes, the sir. name. I know. I know. Yes, sir. Yes, well, sir. And, I uh, hope one day things improve. This COVID-19 goes away. And I have not visited India since 2017. And I've got many friends there. Sir, and I think uh, if, I, if I want to write anything more, it would be more in the direction of finding what is common amongst us. Uh, what sir. can be done? I still sir. work. I still think that the bhakti spirit, the yoga, the Goraknathi yogi's way of looking at things, the Muslim Sufi, rebel Sufis at least, their way of looking at things were so wise and so insightful. Uh, we need to... Uh, uh, Retrieve them and apply them to the current conditions in the hope that India and Pakistan can become two normal, neighborly, trustworthy states. If that were to happen, this would be the great historical change and then we will be, South Asia can be a great region of growth and prosperity and so on. Uh, just to say that I am not alone in this when Pakistan and India were about to be partitioned, there was a, a I think, breaking up party in, in, in uh, Quetta at the Staff College, where Aga Muhammad Yahya Khan was then a major, but an instructor. Uh, he uttered these words, you know, first his superior, Colonel Saxena, got up and congratulated uh, him saying that now you are going to have your own state, but let's hope that we remain friends and brothers as we have been in the Indian army. And uh, Aga Muhammad Yahya Khan gets up and says, Sir, what is there to celebrate? Today is a day of mourning. Together we would be a great power. But now we will start fighting one another. I think he was prophetic. Intelligent people could see where this was going to lead us. And then the irony is that in 71, he was the president of Pakistan who had to go to war with India. Once yes. you are in power, like you are a general, when you are in the field, you have to serve your state as is your pledge when you became an officer. Definitely. So I think these human dimensions need to be highlighted. And if uh, Jinnah really said that uh, his heart was in Bombay and all, I think it must be one of his very human moments of being very human. Because all around he had surrounded himself with being correct all the time as the leader of the Muslims. Now he was being somebody you and I are 
when we are associated and we love something if this is true sir so so i think all this shows that human psyche human societies can always change and adjust if you have the proper approach and the good will to to create a better world thank you so much sir thank you so much for your kind words thank you for your time and uh, of course i will uh, leave with a parting message uh, for those uh, who would be watching in this uh, video that for much of his life jina was purposefully vague about his beliefs even today he remains an enigma aloof and distant a half sketch awaiting completion and professor emmer's book does much to complete that sketch thank you so much sir and uh, we look forward to meeting you in india sometime sir thank you sir thank you very much thanks for the discussion today thank you very much